Thank you, Bob. Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Annapolis. I'm Reverend Andy Court, and along with Reverend Mihi Kim Court, we welcome you to worship with us this day wherever you may find yourselves this morning. To help you follow along in our order of worship, you can find the bulletin on our website, which is annapolis-presbyterian.com. Click on one of the worship tabs and you should be able to find a link to today's bulletin that will help you keep up with the liturgy and the order of service. <clears throat> While you're on online and looking through the bulletin, you will also see many notes and announcements for your attention and we hope that you take a moment or two to look through there and to see some of the, the work and the life and the activity that is taking place here at First Presbyterian. Certainly much going on. We have traveled together during this Lenten season through mountains and valleys and desert places and much in between. And so here we are finally now at the beginning of Holy Week on this Palm Sunday, or as it's sometimes called Passion Sunday, a day that is full of drama and paradox, triumph and tragedy. And so we have much to explore and to consider as we make our way to the cross during Holy Week. To that end, you are invited to join us for our combined Maundy Thursday Good Friday service, which will be available on Thursday at noon on our website. You will be able to find that worship service there too. Please do be aware that we will be celebrating the sacrament of our Lord's Supper at that service, so be sure to gather your elements ahead of time. Friends, let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of God. We remember that the psalmist said, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. In the words of the prophet Zechariah, rejoice, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, for lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Beloved, come, let us worship God.
siblings in Christ, trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Hosanna, we pray. Save us, Lord. Save us from ourselves when we trip over pride, doubt, or fear. Save us from the systems that keep us bound when we cannot see the way out. Save us from our sins when we feel their weight pressing on our hearts. Remind us, O Lord, that crowds shouting Hosanna will soon be screaming, crucify him. Save us, we pray, O Lord, and do not let us be among them. who makes a covenant on our hearts is faithful and forgives our sins and failures. In Christ, God offers forgiving grace and welcome into a community of trust, abundance, and hope. Let us give thanks for the mercy of God and carry the peace of Christ wherever we go into the world. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Time with Children. My name is Miss Good and this is my trusted assistant, Dixie. Today is the sixth Sunday in Lent and it is also Palm Sunday. Now in past years before COVID, we were at the church and the children helped us give out palms and we would wave them in the air and shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. Do you know what that means? It literally means praise or joy. Now, there's a lot to be joyful about on Palm Sunday. We celebrate that day that Jesus rode his donkey into Jerusalem and crowds surrounded him shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and even spread palm branches out on the ground or the path that he was taking into Jerusalem. Now, Jesus was bringing hope and even though we're at home, we can still celebrate this important day. I invite you to make a palm. If you don't have one, you can draw one like this on a piece of paper, color it in. You can even use green construction paper, cut it out and pretend that it's a palm to wave in the air like this. You can also go out to your garden or outside, what do you think, Dixie, and find something that kind of looks like a palm branch to use. Now, it kind of reminds me of something that we have in our Lenten bag. Go get your Lenten bag at home. Dixie, what's in here? What's in here? And pull out this bag of seeds. Mine has a lot of different, you see Dixie, a lot of different shapes and size seeds. Hmm. Have you ever planted a seed and watched it grow? Well, it doesn't happen quickly. It takes a lot of time. It takes patience. It takes water. It takes good soil. It takes sunlight. And you know what? It requires a process. But when it does peek through a little green in the ground, what an amazing thing. Have you also heard of something called planting a seed? And I don't mean like planting one of these seeds in the ground. I mean planting an idea. One idea that I think I've planted over the years 
is the idea of feeding our fish, our fish banks. You've had these banks at home for six weeks, and I've been asking you to fill them with pennies and dimes and nickels and dollars and all sorts of change to submit to us to catch on Palm Sunday and to use that money to help those in need. Now, since you can't bring your fish bank to church right now, you can go online on our website and make a donation under the online giving. Now, I wonder if something this small, a seed in this bag, could literally grow into something this big. You know, that is hope. And we can all use a little bit of hope right now. So grab whatever you have at home, grab a palm that you made or grab something from outside and let's say Hosanna, Hosanna together. Dixie, are you ready? Dixie, come on. Dixie, wake up. She's not interested. One, two, three. Hosanna, Hosanna. Let us pray. Dear God, we give thanks for seeds that grow and fish that help feed others. Amen. verses 1 to 2, 19 to 29. 
O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Blind the festal procession of with branches up to the thorns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Friends, please play, pray with me. Good and gracious God, in the midst of so much happening in our lives and in, in our world, we ask that once more you would come and, and be with us, that you would quiet within us every voice but your own. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I certainly don't have to tell you that so much has changed in terms of how we understand things. Remember back to around this time a year ago, we all thought that all we had to do was not touch our faces and simply flatten the curve, and then we'd be back in worship by Easter. Little did we know we would not even be back by this Easter a year later. And so we've had to change and adjust, become a little more flexible and a lot more patient. Our life together is now understood in a whole new way. The old adage is true, the only constant is change, and it's fascinating to consider what will change once all of this is over. To be sure, the church now looks completely different than it did even a year ago. Community is something else now, too. And do you remember when masks were just something that kids wore on Halloween? Even our vocabulary has shifted, both in meaning and in usage. I feel like I've said the words Zoom, link, host, mute, shared screen more in the past year than any other year that I can recall. But a shift in vocabulary is not a new phenomenon brought on by the pandemic. It's been happening for a while. A few years ago, the Washington Post had an article outlining 24 words that mean something different now than they did before the internet. For example, a troll. A troll used to mean a dwarf in folklore who would live under bridges or in caves or in hills. Now, a troll is someone who makes alarming or disparaging comments online, hoping to sow discord and upset people. The word tweet used to be a chirping note sung by a bird. Now it's a very short message posted on Twitter. 
a text. A text used to be a piece of literature, especially one that's studied. Now a text is something that we send over our phones. And words such as cloud, footprint, block, catfish, friend, like, and follow all have changed meanings over the years thanks to the internet. Shifts in our vernacular happen all the time. If you say that someone is bad, it can mean that they're actually very good. And then something that is hot or lit or even on fire might also be very cool at the same time. It's a lot to keep up with. In our passage this morning, we come to another word that has shifted meanings over time. Hosanna. You know that the New Testament was written in Greek and the Old Testament first written in Hebrew. And so wherever the word Hosanna appears in the New Testament, do you know what the Greek word is? It's Hosanna. All the English translators did was to use the English letters H-O-S-A-N-N-A -N -N -A, to make the sound of the Greek word. But if you look in the Greek dictionary to find what Hosanna means, you will find that it's really not originally a Greek word after all. The authors of the New Testament in Greek did the same thing to a Hebrew word that our English translators did to the Greek word. They just used Greek letters to make the sound of a Hebrew phrase. Our English word Hosanna comes from a Greek word Hosanna, which comes from a Hebrew phrase Hoesha Na. And that Hebrew phrase is found in just one place in the whole Old Testament, Psalm 115, verse 25, where it means, save, please. It's a desperate cry to God for help, like when someone pushes you off the diving board before you know how to swim, and you come up frantically yelling, help, save me, please, Hosanna. One commentator put it this way. Something happened to that phrase, Hosanna. The meaning changed over the years. In the psalm, it was immediately followed by the exclamation, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The cry for help, Hosanna, was answered almost before it came out of the psalmist's mouth. So over the centuries, the phrase Hosanna stopped being a cry for help in the ordinary language of the Jews. Instead, it became a shout of hope and exultation. It used to mean save, please, but gradually it came to mean salvation has come. It used to be what you would say when you fell off or were pushed off of the diving board into the deep end before you could swim, but it came to mean what you would say when you see the lifeguard coming to save you. It knows surely that help is coming. It's the bubbling over of a heart that sees hope and joy and salvation on the way and just can't keep it in. We could think of the word Hosanna to mean something like salvation, it's coming, it's here, salvation, salvation. And on that very first Palm Sunday, as Jesus rode into town on the donkey, and the people placed palm branches and coats all around, this was the phrase that they were shouting, Hosanna. As Jesus rode into town, that's what was on their lips. Before they knew it or not, they were recognizing that salvation was on its way. In fact, it had been closer than they had ever been before. Hosanna, salvation, it's coming, it's here. But you know, words are not the only thing that change over time. Communities change, understandings change, and people do too. I remember as a kid in the church that I grew up in on Palm Sunday, we would try to recreate this scene. And so we would all grab our palm branch and, and parade around the church and then into the church, waving our palm branches, smiling, and, and mom would be taking pictures and we'd all be shouting Hosanna like it was some sort of ticker tape parade down Main Street after a championship. And so I wonder then if the temptation for us may be to imagine the crowd that day as a sweet, sing-songy, happy, clappy, palm branch waving group singing a joyful children's anthem. 
but in reality, they were not. These were people, most of whom were on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, gathered for the Passover celebration and its reenactment of liberation. Remember, they'd been used to living under oppression, and their Hosanna, loud Hosanna, was really a cry for God to save us. Hosanna carries with it the expectation of divine vindication, victory, and deliverance. It carried with it a sense of urgency, help us now, save us now. The scene was charged with energy and with passion, full of the dynamics of politics and power. And this wasn't just any old rally. It was a counter protest to what was happening just on the other side of the city as Pontius Pilate rode into town himself. And while Jesus and his humble procession showed an alternate vision in the kingdom of God, Pilate's procession embodied power, glory, and violence of the empire that ruled the world. We could think of some examples of more recent history to help us see some parallels with a crowd gathering in hopes of, of liberation or salvation from oppression and injustice and salvation and in, uh, justice and in hope of an alternate vision from the status quo for our communities. For example, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963 where Dr. King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. The Selma to Montgomery marches in 1965 for voting rights in the black community. The anti-Vietnam War protests in 1969 that drew a half a million people to Washington and the anti-nuclear march in New York in 1982 true, true, that, that drew over a million people. Even more recently, we have seen the Million Man March, the Pride Parades, the Women's March in Washington, D.C., and the March for Our Lives to End Gun Violence, something that we have been unable and unwilling to do as we have tragically seen in Atlanta and in Boulder, Colorado. We have seen march after march and protest after protest following the events of Ferguson, Missouri and in support of Black Lives Matter. We see marches in support of the Asian American community as we seek to, in the words of the hashtag, stop Asian hate, like it was the case in Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. Many of these are happening in big cities, but you know as well as I do that they've been happening in small towns with small crowds, but the witness is just as fervent. These are but a few examples of the passionate and energetic crowds of people gathering from all over in one place because something is not right. Something in society is broken. Someone is being oppressed and mistreated. Too many kids at too many schools and in too many neighborhoods and now massage parlors and grocery stores are being shot. Too many people are being oppressed in the dream of the prophet Amos where justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That is still unfulfilled. And in these marches and protests, they are hoping to raise awareness, yes, but they are all hoping for real change to take place, to make this world of ours more equitable, safer, fairer, more loving, and more the way God intended it to be for all people. Hosanna. Help us, save us now. And so the people of God who were there in that crowd that first Palm Sunday had long been hoping for someone to be able to save them as they waited on the promised coming reign of God. And to put it simply, they were hoping that Jesus would be the one to save them. Hoping against hope that something would change. And I wonder, do we still hope that something can change? Do we dare even have hope, even now? Because we know that leader after leader has let us down, do we dare to hope even now with mass shootings and racism and the pandemic and the exhaustion from it all? Well, I don't know about you, but what is so fascinating to me about this original Palm Sunday crowd is how quickly they change. 
One day they're waving palm branches and laying out garments for Jesus and his donkey to ride into town on, all with great messianic hope that indeed this would finally be the one to save and deliver Israel, Hosanna. But as the minutes turn to hours, the hours turn to days, the mood begins to darken and it gets even more intense. And the cheers and the chants of the crowd change from Hosanna to crucify. And so they opt for Barabbas to be freed and for Jesus to be executed. We ask why? Why? Was Jesus not acting fast enough for them? Was he not doing all of the things that they wanted him to do? We all know he wasn't decent and in order. Did he disappoint their expectations? Was he not meeting all of their needs, their endless list of needs? Did they remember all of the wild and unorthodox things that he said, you know, things like love God and love your neighbor as yourself? Things like give away all your possessions and follow him. Well, whatever the case may have been, the cheering, chanting crowd went crazy that week. They ordered him to be killed. And the people who were in charge, those religious and political leaders who were making life so hard for the crowd in the first place, well, this time they actually listened. Even some of the disciples, those thought to be closest to Jesus, just like the crowd, they changed their tune during this holiest of weeks with denial and betrayal. It was like they all turned and suddenly Jesus was all alone. And so all of this just went together and it created the perfect storm, one in which the faithful son of God was betrayed, one in which the liberating Lord was incarcerated, one in which the one who is like us in every way except for sin was found guilty, one in which the servant who cured and healed was suddenly suffering, one in which the Lord of life was put to death, all of this in the span of a week. That first Palm Sunday kicked off a week unlike any other. That first Holy Week, no one really understood or was prepared for how all of it would play out. In that week, the people experienced many difficult things. And there were many emotions that no doubt began to bubble up and, and perhaps bubble over, spilling out like something cooking in a cauldron. It was a week where everything changed, never to be the same again. It was a week when the way people understood and experienced life shifted and changed in profound ways. It was a week of great fear, worry, anxiety, stress, and confusion. It was a week when last meals were eaten together. It was a week when those who were supposedly close to Jesus turned and denied and betrayed him. It was a week when leaders washed their hands of any real responsibility. It was a week that ended in death. And as Jesus hung upon the cross between two thieves, we can see that death does not discriminate between good and bad. It comes to all of us, guilty and innocent alike. But friends, as we know, that death was not the whole story. For that week finally ended, and then the new week began. And that week carried with it another story. And that story is one of abundance and hope beyond hope and of new life. Yes, that first holy week was a week that began with a parade and the people cheering for a savior. Little did they know how close salvation already was. Hosanna, salvation has come. It's here. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us bring the needs of the church, the world, and all in need to God's loving care. Saying together, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you in his name. Confident in your love and mercy, we offer our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide. That united in your truth and love, the church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering. Give us, who consume most of the earth's resources, the will to reorder our lives, that all may have their rightful share of food, medical care, and shelter, and so have the necessities of a life of dignity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress. Free us from crime and violence. Guard us from the perils that would seek to take away life. Give all citizens a new vision of a life of harmony. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love, that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may conform to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and sacraments that we may faithfully minister in your name and witness to your love and grace for all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all these things for which we pray, give us the will to seek them, to seek to bring them about for the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, 
Keep your hearts and minds secure in the knowledge and in the love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.